And Elizabeth Cady Stanton figured out a way to get around it. She basically said to the world, look, I have had seven children. I have raised seven children. I am now a grandmother. Look at my gray hair. I am a grandmother. Look at my, I am really a grandmother. I'm just going to go out just as a grandmother, just to wander around, you know, because I've done my thing. I believe in all the womanly roles. And here I am a grandmother. I'm going out and it worked. And she could go anywhere. She'd be on trains playing cards all night with soldiers, you know, and nobody thought it was bad because she was the grandmother. She is also the author of America's Women, As Texas Goes, Scorpion Tongues, and the Millennium Book. She writes currently a column for the Times, as all of us know, twice weekly. Let's get on with today's talk. Welcome, Gail Collins. I'm so happy to be here today. I am always happy to be in Boston. My husband is from Boston, and I grew up in Cincinnati and then went to college in Milwaukee. All that time, my dream was that I would eventually wind up in Boston. My parents got married in Boston, and they talked about it all the time when I was growing up. It's the best city in the world. This is where you're going to go. So I'm in Marquette, Marquette, in Milwaukee, going to get a graduate degree for one of anything else to do at the time. And I thought, well, I'm going to go to Boston. This will be it. So I got applications for the University of Massachusetts, which I believed was in Boston. <laughs> and I flew here. And then I got on the bus to Amherst, which I thought would be this little tiny trip. And it kept going and going and going and going. So, but I'm so glad to be here finally. Thank you so much for coming. And um, thank you for letting me talk a little bit about my, my new thing here, my book. Um, I got into this. First, this thought about doing a book about older women and where they were in American history. When, when I was writing an earlier book, I ran into a, a letter that one of the colonists had sent back to England, and they were all guys at that point. They wanted wives, and they were sending their requirements for a good wife. And the requirement was, if they be but civil and under 50 years of age. <laughs> Wow, and then looking forward a lot, I, I was, I, there was this ad, I, you probably some of you remember, for love and care, you're not getting older, you're getting better, back in the 70s. It begins with, in this youth-made world, when a woman's over 25, she's considered old. So I thought, wow, you go from under 50 is great to 25 is old, and then you move forward here to Nancy Pelosi is pushing 80, running the world, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg is running and going to Supreme Court. And how did all this happen? What does it mean? You know, why, why? And the one great cosmic thought that I came up with over all this is that women are regarded age-wise the same way men are, basically, when they are economically valuable to society. In the early days, the colonial days, early America, well, you know, into toward the Civil War, whenever you're on a farm in particular, the women were really, really, really valuable. They, they, they grew stuff, they had chickens, they made candles, they made butter, they spun yarn, they made clothes. They created a ton of wealth for their families. And they had an economic sort of parallel economic universe of women that they could trade things and bring in other things into the household. Young women were dying to come to hang out with them because they wanted to learn how to do all this stuff too and to create wealth for their families. So they, I, I've got to read you this because my, even though we're going to be fast today, my favorite thing from this era, Esther Lewis. Thank God kept a diary. We would never know this at all. We're talking about the early 1800s in Pennsylvania. She's a farm wife. She's widowed at 42. In her 60s, she's running the farm. She's churning 288 pounds of butter a year, making 1,000 candles. She's educating four daughters, sheltering runaway slaves. She discovered ore on her property and opened an iron mine. And while all this is going on, her mom moves in and begins spinning 33,000 yards of yarn a year. So they were popular, very, very popular. Everybody wanted to hang out with them, too. And, and this went on, life kind of went on like this until after the revolution in particular, when old people in general were kind of out, you know, up with the young, with the new, and particularly people started moving into the cities. And if you're in a city in the 1800s, and you're married, 
and you're the middle class family, all you're supposed to do is to have kids and raise them. And they've got really no other role. There's no role for women except being wives, mothers, raising the kids. And once the kids are raised, you are not only metaphorically, but literally sitting in a corner in a rocking chair because there's really not much more for you to do. And the valuation of women is only mothers. I cannot express better than talking about my favorite, Martha Washington. I was never into Martha Washington until I wrote this book, and I now think about Martha Washington every day, I swear. It's, it's strange and peculiar, but there you are. She was married before George, had children, her husband died, she ran the business and did it very, very well, and then George came along, she married him, he took the business, they moved to Mount Vernon, and her job then became the mistress of the great estate of Mount Vernon, which was a real mess until George got Martha's money and used it to renovate the whole place. So there she is. You're getting, all she's doing is entertaining visitors, but you are getting like 300 visitors a year. And some of them stay for months. They don't go away. And she's in charge of everything, making sure that they get fed and clothed. And it's beyond running a hotel the effort that Martha is making there. And after dinner, you're in charge of entertaining all these people because obviously they're not gonna go watch television. They, they all retire to the living room and have a sherry or something. And George would sneak out and go back to his study, <laughs> leaving Martha to take care of all these people, which she did brilliantly. And one senator, this is my other, uh, said after going there and having a really great time, if I live much longer, I believe I shall at last be reconciled to the company of old women. At the time, Martha was 58 and he was 56. <laughs> Just saying. Life goes on like that. Once women move into the cities, it's all about mothers and your economic value is gone and you're regarded as old once you pass childbearing age, really. When did this change again? when women started becoming economically valuable outside the work at the home. Particularly, my favorite one, World War II. All the guys are gone. The younger women do not, the children do not want to go to work. It's, they resist very strongly. So suddenly, the nation's eyes turn to the older women to do all the stuff that needs to be done. And there are magazine stories celebrating not just Rosie the Riveter, Josephine the 80-year-old Riveter, who's in there still doing her planes. Uh, another of my favorite stories was from another magazine talking about how it's so wonderful these days when you go into a restaurant to see a 60-year-old woman carrying a tray of dishes with a bright sparkle in her blue eyes. <laughs> Not sure about the sparkle, but the idea was there. Everybody get in there. If you can only move dishes, move dishes. Time to do this stuff. Um, six million women went back to work during that war. And one and a half million of them were 45 to 65. A quarter of a million of them were over 65, and they just kept at it. And then, of course, other things happened. The 50s happened, the 60s happened. People, the boomers came along and shoved everybody else out of the way. There was no idea where it was a good idea for older women to go to work, because you could never trust anybody over 30 back then, they said. And then everything changed again. In the 1970s, Suddenly, the great boom from the war, the great post-war boom, which led everybody to believe that they were supposed to be middle class, that you were supposed to aspire to a home, to send your kids to college. Suddenly, the oil boycott happened, the economy fell apart, and this world, this life that everyone had come to expect and want could no longer be supported on one salary. And that changed everything. The whole young girls in high school and college thought about themselves not only as getting married, but what kind of job they were going to have to help support the family. I will never forget in the early 80s, I think it was, I was in New Britain, Connecticut for some reason at a college. And for some other reason, I was talking to an entire room full of boys. And I'm not quite sure what it was that got me there, but they were lovely. And uh, I asked them what they were looking for in a wife. And they weren't gonna say a beautiful woman while I was standing there. So they said, uh, someone with a good personality. And, and then one guy in the back said, and a good earner. 
And the other said, yes, a good earner. She has to be a good earner. It was that was the expectation for everybody. And once that happened, everything changed. Once that happened and everybody thought of themselves as being in the same kind of workforce, as having the same kind of future, as being in the same role in the economy, women were no longer regarded as getting older in a different way than men were. Older women were regarded as people who could do the same stuff that older men could do. Ruth Bader Ginsburg going on strong. It was all fine. It all worked, and I cannot tell you how amazing that is to me uh, that I got to watch that happen. I got to live through that transformation, which when you think about it, about everything that's happened, it's a change that's never happened in the history of Western civilization women being totally incorporated into the workforce on an equal level with men, a world in which if suddenly the doctor comes to the maternity room and says, sir, you have a new daughter, the guy does not say, oh no, he had a family business I wanted to leave to somebody, what will I do? It all works out the same, and it's for all the things we still need to fight for, for all the things that are important for the future, and that's something that I just, can't help celebrating in every day. And when people ask me about my own career, what I always like to point out is that the changes that happened in journalism that happened for my generation happened because women who were older than me went to court, went on strike, held up picket signs, got in the face of their employer all the time and forced newspapers TV stations, every place to recognize that you've got to have women too. And you've got to give them room for improvement and for promotion the same way that you do men. And um, you've got, you get, to, then one day you get to make one of them the head of the editorial department. And I cannot tell you how happy people were when I was wandering around when they said I was going to be the first woman to head the editorial department. And it wasn't because of me. It was the idea of, oh my God, look at this. We did this other thing. And when I think about that, I always think about the women who came before me at the paper who filed those lawsuits. And the Times rolled over pretty quick once they realized what was coming down the pike, but forced the Times to reevaluate its relationships, to consider diversity in every level, including gender, to hire and promote women. And the women who got rewarded were not the women who staged the fight because they were a older and they were already in everybody's face and you know, blah, blah, blah. people like me who were walking in the door at that very moment were the ones who got all the benefit. And I have often seen those women over the years, talk to them so often. To me, the definition of a great heart is a person <coughs> who takes joy in somebody else getting the thing they wanted to get. And those women were so happy to see the things that we were getting. They were so happy when I got to run the editorial page. They were so happy, and it wasn't for them. It was because they wanted it to happen for the next group. And that kind of spirit is, to me, the spirit that keeps everything going. It's the spirit of this generation, and it's, it's, it's the thing that's going to move us forward into the future in which everybody hopefully can do as much as they can do, as long as they can do it and we're gonna celebrate them all for it. And I wanna thank you so much for being here today. I think I've taken more time than I'm allowed to, but it's just so much fun to talk to you guys and tell this story. And now Margaret's gonna come back and we're gonna talk. We had a vibrant tradition in this country of lectures during a certain time period, and all the music halls everywhere were filled with people lecturing. Uh, and I just, I, you know, I, I love hearing about those women. There was one woman who was a celebrity on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, she was so wanted in speaking halls and in speaking um, in places where her wisdom would be called upon. But here you are, and we feel so lucky, and you're out speaking, and you know, you probably got a, a book launch two days ago, and you're probably crisscrossing the country. Um, but how do you, how does it feel to you to be in that tradition of speaking women? Well, totally honored, and, and you know, I, I love to talk about them because for so long, the only entertainment people had was people coming to speak. That was the very big deal. And um, my favorite, can I tell, tell one story? It's just please, one of my, my favorite story along this line was um, as the anti-slavery movement was growing, it was, it was mostly in the North women who were really, really, really obsessed with the idea of the evils of slavery because they saw it as something that attacked the family, 
that divided families, that left young women at, at, at the mercy of slave owners. And they wanted to go out and talk about it, but the idea of speaking in public was regarded for a woman as so shocking back then. You just were not supposed to do it. They threw stones at women who do it. Even in the African American community, they did not want to see women doing it. And it was just, they called, it was, well, some poor woman, it was the red harlot of iniquity, I think it was, because she spoke in public. So there was this real problem. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton figured out a way to get around it. She basically said to the world, look, I have had seven children. I have raised seven children. I am now a grandmother. Look at my gray hair. I am a grandmother. Look at my, I am really a grandmother. I'm just gonna go out just as a grandmother, just to wander around, you know, because I've done my thing. I believe in all the womanly roles. And here I am a grandmother, I'm going out, and it worked. And she could go anywhere. She'd be on trains playing cards all night with soldiers, you know, and nobody thought it was bad because she was the grandmother. And she would go then and give her speech about boys and living at home and raising your kids. And then she'd throw in abolition and then she'd throw in women's suffrage and then she'd throw in divorce reform. I mean, she just had all these radical ideas and she just kept sneaking them in to her grandmother's speech, and it worked for her. And I've always just thought what a great, smart, sneaky way of getting around all this was. And the, the, her friends, by the way, were, then started writing odes to menopause. That was the, the, the glorious menopause. You use this term um, that sometimes the math, radical messages of the day are best said through the filter of gray-haired maternity, that you know, with our age comes a wisdom to talk um, and I think now of Mothers Out Front, or I think of you know the radical peace movement that, we're, that you talk about. Um, Women strike for peace, where everybody wore mink coats and you know to picket the White House. <laughs> yeah, and there are some uses to old age. Yeah. Old age. Um, you talk about um, you talk about Mother Jones, and that she was very fond of being old, and that. Um, yeah, she, Mother Jones celebrated her hundredth birthday when she was ninety-two. She really. <laughs> Um, looking now at, at the image of women in America, um, it appears that for decades, and particularly in the 20th and the 21st century, there's been a real, you know, it's a constant flip-flop that women are subjected to. You know, at one moment, being single is oh so fashionable, and then later, it's, you know, the cult of June Cleaver domesticity, and then we go from the homemaker maybe Eisenhower, you know, right to the culture queen, uh, Jackie Kennedy, um, and everybody wants to be, as you say, reedy, reedy thin, like Twiggy. Um, and then somehow in this culture, in this country, that all of us women, uh, even within the same 10-year period, strive to be both at once, or we suddenly are this, or we're suddenly that, as, as, you, you know, as a general group. And then there's plastic surgery, and there's no plastic surgery. You use the word haunting, you know, that women are haunted by all sorts of images and perceptions of what they're supposed to be. And my question is, what is haunting women today as you see it, aside from politics? <laughs> well, that's enough, really, I would think, to get anybody very busy. It's, um, I talk to a lot of women who, who have had cosmetic surgery who say it's not about trying to look younger for men, it's about trying to compete with other men, women at work who have had com cosmetic surgery. So if you want to look younger than they are, or at least as young as they do, or at least as in, or at least um, the same way. And uh, it, it's always going to be stuff. Uh, there's, we're never going to be beyond stuff. And it's true also that I have to admit completely that the entertainment industry has not been nearly as enlightened as the rest of the world has been when it comes to age issues. If you have a group of people that are all the same age, they're going to make the women play the mothers of the guys. And I mean, everybody knows that in The Graduate, Dustin Hoffman was only two years younger than Anne Bancroft when they made that movie. But, you know. It goes on and on and on, and we have not solved that problem. You know, even though Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin do their best in, uh, on TV. And you know, stuff is gonna happen, stuff is gonna change, and as long as women are important economically, it's interesting to me that advertisers are taking a very long time to pick up on what everybody seems to know is true statistically, that 
There is no worse customer than a 25-year-old guy. He's got no money whatsoever for anything, as opposed to, say, a 65-year-old woman, many, many of whom have estates that are $1 million or more at this point in time, many of whom have large incomes. And it's going to take a while for that message to get through, but I have, I have confidence that sooner or later even that is going to happen. And, uh, Whenever I complain about it, then somebody says, Meryl Streep, Meryl Streep. But it's true. You know, when Meryl turned 40, she got an offer for, I think, three different parts, all involving playing witches at the same time. But, but she came around, and she was back, and she had thousands of romantic adventure stories and everything else, and she's still popping along today. Um, there is an amazing, a good passage in your book about Jane Fonda and Catherine Hepburn on, on Golden Pond, was, I think, the movie that Jane directed her. Um, and that there was a real generational conflict offset and onset for those women. And I, I wonder if you, and you know, if you look back as you talk about the radical women, the new radicals versus the older now women, uh, National Organization for Women, that there have always been, even among women, generational conflicts. Yeah, that went back to the suffrage movement. There was a generational crisis within the suffrage movement. But there always is going to be a generational crisis everywhere because there are always going to be young people coming up who want to do stuff, not only their own way, but want to personally be in charge of doing stuff their own way. And you saw that when Nancy Pelosi you know, picked up the speakership uh, when the Democrats took control in the House, there were a lot of younger people who said, you know, what about us? And then she came up with a compromise, which she's going to do, I think, four years, and then she's going to step aside and let somebody else have a turn. And that's a legitimate discussion to have, the difference between respecting everybody's rights and giving everybody a chance to have a turn. And I, 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 that happens a lot, and a smart company, I think, will approach that in a smart and staying way, which is not like, I remember, it was Ohio State, it was one of the colleges which the head of, I think it was the economics department, wrote a letter saying, riding herd on old women is like herding turkeys or something like that, and which led them to the evidence they needed to file an age discrimination suit, which they eventually won. Um, and you know, there are, there are, it's against the law to discriminate against anybody for age. It's a harder case to prove than gender or race is, but it, the law is there. And there's no reason not to, to keep fighting for it. You mentioned in your book that the secret to staying young is discontent. That to be discontented is a good thing. It keeps you, what, are you cause-minded? It keeps you justice-oriented? It keeps you outwardly directed in a way. I mean, I, I don't think it's a good idea to be discontented with, say, your spouse all the time. That would be very, very bad. Um, but, but yeah, if, if, you, if all the women, there, besides all the women I've talked about who had these great moments moving into the economy, there are also millions of stories of generations of women who were stuck someplace in their housewife role or whatever and figured out that what they needed to do was to get out in their communities and change things there. Um, Jane Addams, you know, sort of led the way for the whole idea of women taking over settlement houses, you know, running services for the poor, and that's better than anything, you know, if you can do it. I have to say that I just suddenly, thinking about my husband while we were just going through this, I had, people ask me a lot, well, how do you deal with getting old and stuff, and I said, oh, well, you know, good. And I had a party for this book, a friend of mine gave it in New York a couple of weeks ago, and I was looking out, you know, at the crowd when I got up to accept a toast, and there was one woman there that I had known since the Eisenhower administration. She came from my, my school back home, and you know, my husband was there. We'd been married for 49 years. And I'm thinking of all these people, and there were new people that I've added on every year that I've been able to be alive, and looking at all those people, that I've got to spend my life with, that I can grow old with, that, and then I get added on every year of new people that come along. I mean, my God, that's the best thing in the entire world. You cannot be ha unhappy when you have that kind of thing to think about. Me and my friends, we loved Mary Tyler Moore. 
and you've got a <laughs> section about Mary Tyler Moore in the book. Um, and that you've got a comment, at the time it came out, the St. Petersburg Times reporter um, reviewed the series and said, um, it's the return of a delightful and talented actor, actress, but I just can't get excited about the life of a 30-year-old spinster. <laughs> and she showed him, didn't she? Yes. <laughs> she did show him. Uh, and that's you know right up there with the same time period. Um, the Geritol commercial, my wife, I think I'll keep her. Uh, Everybody knows Geritol is alcohol, right? I mean, that's, that's, yeah, it's partly alcohol. That was the secret to all of these sort of things. <laughs> um, I also was amazed, Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique was previewed in Good Housekeeping Magazine under the headline, Women Are People Too. Yeah, they wanted to start out clearly a tiptoeing. <laughs> so they started with the controversial headline, Women Are People Too, and then they moved on and it became the feminine mystique. And, and by the way, Betty Friedan, when she was getting, uh, I think it was her 60th birthday, People wanted to give a party for it, and she went crazy. She didn't want to think about it. She hated it. She couldn't accept it. She was suicidally depressed. And she got over it when you would know it, being ready for dead. By the time she's 65, she's having her party at a disco in, in Manhattan. <coughs> and she started a book that she publishes when she's 70 called Feminine Forever, in which she screams about people who won't let you keep working after you're 80. And I mean, just, Betty, for, just look at her. I mean, good. The, the um, in 1986, that Newsweek article about how single women over college educated single college women. educated single women over 45 were more likely to be killed in a terrorist attack than to marry, yes. which uh, was uh, which was headlines and you use the word again haunting that it haunted women. <laughs> Decades. It did. It was came down later. It was named one of the wrongest pieces of statistic in recent history in America. I mean, it was not true at all, but it did haunt an entire generation of women, young college-age women, who had this vision of, oh my God, if I don't get married by the time I'm 40, I'm doomed forever, unless a terrorist attack okay. eliminates itself. <laughs> and they weren't even big things in 1986. No, no, no. They were really infrequent then. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I have two last questions, and then we're coming to you all. Uh, so I am curious about, first off, the cult of youth um, that you talk about. You know, remember Mary Poppins coming on the scene, and oh my god, those poor children almost had an aged nanny, and here, thank heaven, is Mary Poppins. It's the Cruella de Vil syndrome. If you um, want a really bad person, you get a little old lady. Yeah, and then thank heaven somebody younger comes on scene. Um, and then, you know, this you talk about the wisdom of age and that women were and still valued in some circles for what they know and what they can do, but with all this technology that we have, it seems that the youth are particularly valuable to many people now that, you know, you used to be able to tell a 22-year-old all sorts of things, and now you just look at them and say, do you have a moment for myself? <laughs> <laughs> Could you help me with my computer? So, what do you know, about this? I, and I do, I do frequently when I talk about all, I, I'm, I tend to be an optimistic person and about things are working out, how well they are. I, I often tend to say, well, not right now in tech, but soon. This will happen soon, too. But uh, there are already a bunch of older and sometimes really older women who have taken over, developed sites of their own on the web and created like huge audiences and then begin advertising and moving products. and. It, it, it doesn't stop anybody who's, who wants to do it. It's just a matter of adapting. We can do that. Good, I like that. <laughs> and then uh, you mentioned a number of women's clubs through history, that there have always been a need for women to be organized and to be in groups of women. Yeah. And you know those clubs have changed mission and changed. Some of them are literary, some of them are cause-minded. But what, how do you see that as a role today, women organizing? in various formal and informal ways. Well, it still happens a lot. You see suddenly, you know, something's going on. Suddenly there's the 58th Street women against, you know, people being assaulted on the street or whatever it is. Often you see 
women getting together to organize things. And I, I, I was talking to a group the other night, and they said, well, isn't it disturbing that still after all these years we still have women's stuff, you know, and that's not just all together. But I kind of love the idea that women can still rally together and find a cause and go out there and take care of it, do something about it. I think that's on to the future. I like that a lot. So, excellent. Well, now we're going to look out to you. Give us questions. questions. So I was struck when you were talking about Elizabeth Cady Stanton that she had to, to, to couch herself as a grandmother in order to get her points across. And it occurs to me that really is relevant for many of us who came up in the corporate world today that we have to find a way to couch whatever we're going to say that's straightforward or risky into some sort of grandmotherly way so that we're not threatening. It occurred to me, though, that it's your humor. Did you start off writing humor as a way to take away the sting of some of the things that you say? I first got a column when I was in New York at, um, at uh, the New York Daily News, and I was writing about the city council. I was just, oh, it was horrible. It was, you know, but you know, it's, it's like the state legislature. It's just, oh my God, what are they doing now? And I was writing every day, oh my God, what are they doing now? And I got up one day and I thought, I don't want people to get up and then read my column and then throw themselves out a window. <laughs> I want to try and figure out a way to convey this information that will make them feel cheerful after they've got it. And so I've been kind of working on that ever since. That's my life goal, as it were. And uh, it's still an effort, and I'm still, even with Donald Trump, I am still <laughs> pushing right along there. And Mitt and the dog. And Mitt and the dog, yes, yeah. Mitt and the dog. I have a number of people who wanted to be here today just because of Mitt and the dog. Really? Yeah, they love the Mitt and the dog. Do you dog. want to talk about Mitt and the dog? Yes, yeah. yeah. the Mitt and the dog. Story. The story of Mitt and the dog was from the Boston Globe. Uh, when Mitt Romney first announced he was running for president, the Globe ran this very long, incredibly informative profile. And in it, one of his kids was talking about how disciplined his dad was. And his example was that when they went on family trips, Mitt would pick out ahead of time where the rest stops would be, and you could not stop anywhere that was not on one of those rest stops. So the kids, as we're driving along, and you know, our dog is on the roof of the car, we're going to Canada, and then he, he apparently didn't like it, he got diarrhea. And the kids are there, it's coming down the window, and the kid's going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Mitt swerves off the road into the rest stop, jumps out of the car, grabs a hose, hoses down the dog, hoses down the window, jumps back in the car, races off again without letting anybody else get out of the car. And his son thought that was a good example of how organized he was. And when I read it, my immediate reaction was, he had the dog on the roof of the car, oh my god. So I wrote about that, and I thought it was kind of funny. I only wrote about two or three times, maybe. But, <laughs> but then the campaign began, and frankly, it was really boring. It was a really boring campaign. Mitt Romney was a very boring candidate. So for all of his good qualities, he was a very boring presidential candidate. And so I made a game for myself to see if every time I wrote about him, I could somehow squeeze in one mention of the dog on the roof of the car. <laughs> And at some point, after 90 million times, uh, somebody asked him about it at, at his press conference somewhere. And if at that point he had said, you know, you know what it is when you've got kids, sometimes you just go nuts with kids in the car, and I'm sorry, it was really stupid, but yeah, dumb me. I would have dropped it right then. But his response was, the dog liked the fresh air. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I'm on weapon. <laughs> And if you ever come into my office at the Times, that people at that point sent me, somebody in Austin, I think it was, they made this plastic case with a dog, an Irish setter in it, that you're supposed to put on the roof of your car and then tie it into your, your, your lighter so that it lights up when you drive around. And I thought, God, best present ever. This is so cool. I'm so excited about your book, and I've been following you on your television interviews. And I just wonder if you would share the love letter that Donald Trump sent you. Would you please? <laughs> Good. Share, share it. Good. That's, my, that's the other thing you can come and see if you come to my office. It's framed now in my office. This was in 1992, and I was a columnist at New York Newsday, and I was covering the city council. And um, Trump came down. He was in his disastrous economic period, you know, when everything had fallen apart for him. And he was trying to talk the city council into giving him some super duper special deal to develop pro property along the riverfront 
I can't remember what it was exactly now, but it was kind of crazy. And um, and he was he was sort of a jerk too. So when I came back, I was sort of amused. So I wrote a column about it, and I referred to him as America's most famous thousandaire. <laughs> and a day or two later, a cop I get this message letter. A copy of my column is on there, and written in the sharpie that you have now come to all know and love. <laughs> My picture is circled and it says, Gail, you are a dog with the face of a pig. If I was like you, I would be angry too. And he misspelled too. <laughs> so first I thought it was somebody from the office, you know. Funny, so we checked the signature against some Forbes there and so it was Donald Trump. So I took it home and I showed it to my husband and I said, isn't this funny? And he went, my God in heaven. And I said, okay, I'm gonna throw it out. And now he said, no. Save it, it's so weird, maybe it'll come in handy. <laughs> and the other day, somebody from a, a collectible place or whatever offered me $10,000 for it. And my sister said, no, this is a family heirloom. We're going to pass it down forever. So, so we've still got it. I was just wondering if you had female mentors in, in your life that have inspired and guided you. Yeah, I have, and it, and it was early on, to be honest with you, when I was just getting started out and I had no idea what I was doing. The first place I worked, uh, my husband got a job after college in uh, New Haven at the Register, and I got a job at this little paper called Fair Press in Westport that was just starting out. And um, it was, there was a woman there, his name was Ruth Ray, and she was, Nobody got paid anything there. So if you, were, if you were there, you were sort of stuck for one reason or another, and she was stuck in Westport. And uh, she just, every time I wrote something, she would make me sit down and say, well, you know, now what are you trying to say here? And what do you want them to get out of it? And think about it this way. And it was never about, okay, it's due, what the hell, let's get it going. She was always trying to make me think about what I was doing and what it meant. And I cannot tell you how much difference that made. And everything I did after that sort of bopped off, off the stuff that Ruth taught me. So yeah, I did. I can't, can't say that there were many mentors at, say, the Times who were women, just because there weren't that many older women there when I got there. Um, but as I said, you know, I just, I got there and totally on the footsteps and sacrifice of people like Betsy Wade, who led the women's uh, women's rights movement at uh, at the paper, and you know it's now the most diversity conscious paper in the world probably. But uh, it was all because of people like Betsy. Your hypothesis is that economic value of women has enabled them to be integrated in the way workforce. But it's true, women today still, even though they integrated, get paid less than men. And will that ever change? And what do you think? About yeah, I think it will, and I, I always, because I, I am sort of pathologically optimistic, and so I tend to give these visions of the future, but I don't tend to mention enough that there are a lot of problems still right now, and certainly one of them is the fact that women make less money. It's in part because women aren't being hired yet at the same numbers for the same jobs, jobs, and partly the tech problem that we've begun to discuss already. But there's no place in, the country where that doesn't need to be looked at. And one of the important roles that women who are in the workplace have is to support other women when this stuff comes up, to pass along information, to watch out for that kind of thing, to make sure that younger women who are coming in are being mentored and, and help to move along. And so, yeah, you're, and I thank you for your point because it's important to stop me every once in a while to make me point out that things are not all great, no. And that's one of the very important ones we have to work on. Do you mind sharing your Uber story? Or your thoughts on Uber? My Uber story? Your Uber. Uber. The, our conversation about Uber, the car, the how you feel about oh. new technology. Well that's, well, that's not really Uber. Well, maybe it is. But I'm, I, in New York, and I suspect you've got a situation that's similar here. Our cab drivers have medallions that cost sometimes a million dollars, partly because of the market, partly because the city kept jacking up the prices so it would get more money from them. And these guys are now running around being threatened by Uber and Lyft drivers who themselves are not making much any money, but 
who are driving down the population of people that are hailing cams in the city. And I, when I started the book tour, um, I told them I have a rule that if there's cams in a city, I will not take an Uber or Lyft. I just, it's just a moral principle for me. It's just some things you just have to stick around for. You know? Could you comment on the Me Too movement? I mean, I'm vacillate between these women, younger women are so fragile versus they're not going to take any garbage. Yeah, I have two thoughts about the Me Too movement. One of them is that it came to the extent that it did when it did because, thank God, of the fact that suddenly there are so many women in the workplace that often men who did not come up trained in the proper way about dealing with women who are their colleagues uh, react very, very badly and have to be retrained all over again. And I was talking about it with somebody the other night and I was recalling that I got and one of the most transformative assignments I ever had as a journalist, I covered the Mike Tyson rape trial when it happened back in the day, I think it was in Indianapolis, and um, it was just so clear listening that Mike Tyson was a thug who had no idea that anybody who walked in his hotel room was not expecting to be ravaged right there and thrown on the bed. And of course, this girl thought she was going to a party to meet celebrities, and it was, it was a tragic thing. But the great thing that came out of it was that I noticed when I got back, there'd be all kinds of stuff going on, and there'd be a lot of educational meetings. And so frequently, the authority figure, whoever it was, would turn to the guys, the young guys in the audience, the teenage boys, and say, this is so important. Here's the message. If she says no, it's serious. It's no. You just have to accept that it's no. And that was way back in the Mike Tyson trial. But even then, that movement was beginning of teaching men that no means no. And the Me Too movement, to me, is in its most important aspects a teaching of men at the workplace in particular that not only no means no, but you just do not go there at all guy anymore. And I, I believe that the next generation of young men is going to be better educated about these things than those that went before. And um, that's, you know, it's, you know, sometimes you keep thinking, oh my God, they keep going on and on and on and on. It doesn't matter. I mean, you just let them go, let them do it, because it's, it's a transformative moment. It really is. I really appreciate what you were saying about being grateful to the women who came before you, and through their work, you were allowed to do something that other women previously hadn't been able to, um, because of an experience I recently had in college. Um, I joined the women's rowing team. And so as part of that, we have a boathouse and we have a locker room and things like that. And our coach sent us an email a couple days ago, um, a rather angry email. He had gone into the locker room and found that it was somewhat of a mess. Um, and we had a race that weekend and it was our home race and many alumnus were coming. And so he sent us this email saying, you know, many of the people coming this weekend are people that gave money to this boathouse. And some of them are the women who years ago stripped in the athletic director's office in protest of the fact that the women's locker room did not have showers. And as a result, you now have showers. Be grateful. Um, so I just wanted to know, how does my generation do right by the women that paved the way so that we can have opportunities that they didn't previously have? And can I say that that's a really weird message to be sending? I mean, you know, that these women did all these things and so clean your room, my God. <laughs> It's a very strange connection. But I mean, the way in general you, you move forward is that first of all, whenever you can, you know, hang out with older women, get their stories, and, and, and try to make them part of your grander circle of, of people that you hang out with. And secondly, wherever you go, whatever you do, follow their leadership and help other women. Find them, find out women who are needing stuff, look around a little bit, you know, and contribute to the community. Those are the three you know, great lessons, I think, that they send down to you. And, uh, but don't clean your room if you don't want to. That's okay. <laughs> so, there are two things that have been bothering me. One is that the Equal Rights Amendment has not yet been passed. The other is that I don't hear the candidates talking about uh, Roe v. Wade and women's right to health care enough, in fact. I don't even think it's on their radar right at this week. But so I was wondering if you had any optimistic views you could share with us <laughs> to help me get off the ledge. I know, it's hard. Well, I have to say in the Roe v. Wade thing, they did in the last, in the last debate, they, it did come up and they, I mean, they all 
raising their hands and running around. But um, we talked to some people the other night, and somebody m mentioned a question along the same level, which was um, she was worried that people didn't talk enough about older women who then have mothers who are really older who need to be taken care of and who feel like their opportunities to you know, live fully their life you know, with, were being sort of drained away by these responsibilities. And I can see there are some people out here who have this issue. And it's interesting to me, there, you, when you listen to these guys as much as I have, the candidates, um, they talk so much, and rightfully so, about college expenses and how somehow the government has to figure out a better way to support young people's right to go to college than the sort of half-assed things that we're doing right now. And I think that's got to be true also on the other end. I'm not really hearing enough talk about what about people late in life who need permanent either resident care or permanent help in their homes. What kind of support system are we building around this country? Is everybody getting the same rights in the same places? What, what are the future opportunities? What are your goals? I don't want to hear anybody getting as worked up about that as they do about you know, the student loan issue. And I think it's an equally pressing issue on, on, on the country. And that if you want to complain about something the next time you hear a candidate running for president, and you'll probably see one any second now walking down the runway somewhere, uh, mention that, because it's, it's a very big deal. I just, I have a wish for you. I hope you keep being funny. You're the first one I read. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you very much.